Chaita Guru, Diksha Guru, Shiksha Guru. <laughs> how many gurus do you know? <laughs> Not how many people, how many types of gurus do you know? Once we counted Raghunath Das Goswami, he had, was it nine or seven? I think nine gurus. He had nine gurus. So then the question is, which one of his gurus was most important? Which one is the most important? He had nine gurus. Uh, Yadunandanacharya was his mantra guru who gave him initiation, Diksha. Then um, when he came uh, on the way to meet Mahaprabhu, he got, uh, he got the blessing of Nichananda Prabhu by, by putting on that yogurt and rice festival. You've, you've heard about this. Well, who is Nichananda? He is Baladev. He is an original Guru Tattva. So is it possible that he served Nichananda Prabhu and abided by his order, but he doesn't find any, any, any Guru is there? Only he sees Vaishnav there? Only devotee? Hmm? So Guru Tattva, Nichananda Prabhu is also his Guru. Then Nityananda Prabhu sent him to Puri, and um, uh, Mahaprabhu turned him over to Swarup Damodar uh, and said, you will give him training. So then Swarup Damodar became his guru, became his teacher. Living in Puri at that time was Namachari Haridas Thakur. He's the Acharya of chanting of the holy names. Could he just pass him by? No, no he is not my guru. No, he had to accept also. He is my guru, Namacharya Haridas Thakur. Rup Sanatan are also living there. That's the Sambandana Acharya and uh, the uh, Abhideya Acharya. These two are foremost of the six Goswamis. Uh, later, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami, <coughs> he lived long time under the care of Rupan Sanatan. He first he lived for a long time in Puri under the care of Mahaprabhu and Srup Damodar. But <clears throat> also it's to mention that uh, living there at that time is Gadadhar Pandit also. Gadadhar Pandit is the uh, is Guru Tattva for the Madhurya Ras Bhaktas in Chaitanya Lila. Mm -hmm. uh, Mahaprabhu is the uh, principal deity. The Madhurya devotees, they are under Gadadhar Pandit. And the Vatsalya and other devotees, they're under Nityananda Prabhu. So he is accepting also uh, uh, Gadadhar Pandit as Guru also. She is, he, he, is, uh, he is Radha Bhav. He is the incarnation of Radharani. So can he not accept that as Guru? So also Gadadhar Pandit, he accepted as Guru. After the disappearance of Mahaprabhu, all these great personalities began to vanish from the earth very quickly. And Raghunath Das was in great despair. He decided to commit suicide. He decided to take the path of suicide. The world became so bleak in the absence of Mahaprabhu. And all devotees leaving one, one after the other. As Narottam Das prays, what will we do now? They're all gone. Beating our head on the stone. Beating my head on the stone. It is not a happy day when the Lord's devotees vanish from this world from our sight. So uh, he was very distressed and he decided to give up his life and he thought that the best way, if, if he can jump from the top of Govardhan Hill, this, in this way he will finish his life. So actually this is love despair. Uh, very, uh, if you have seen Govardhan Hill, you'd have to jump about a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> you'd do better off a garage roof. It is not very high. <laughs> Climb a temple, a tree even. The Govardhan Hill is very gentle. There's nowhere to jump from. But that would let me go to Govardhan or jump from Govardhan Hill. So anyway, uh, because uh, that was his heart sentiment. So he went to Govardhan with this in mind, but there he found Rupa and Sanatan. They were living there on the order of Mahaprabhu, and he found that Mahaprabhu is living in Rupa and Sanatan. This is what he found there. Hmm? That his Supreme Lord is living within their hearts. Rupa and Sanatan... They are the, like, the, what is the proper word? The counter extensions of Mahaprabhu, non different than Mahaprabhu. They are Rup Sanatan, but yet he found them non different. So then he gave up this idea of jumping from Govardhan Hill and he uh, remained under them for many years. <clears throat> 
So there may have, I may have left someone out of the equation. So uh, Raghunath Das Goswami has shown us in his life that he had many, many gurus uh, who first may bring us in some connection to Krishna consciousness. Maybe, uh, maybe it is our parents, maybe a friend at school, some general connection where we get drawn towards uh, the first Sunday feast, whatever it is, something at home, a Back to Godhead magazine. That person who first puts us in connection to Krishna is called Vartmana Pradarshika, Guru. Well, we may have many, have many of these types of gurus, but it is said oh, you should only have one uh, uh, mantra guru, you should only have one initiating guru, but Shiksha gurus, you may have many. So mostly Raghunath Das Goswami, he had, he had uh, many gurus that gave him much instruction and guided him through his career. Then he himself is known as the Prayojan Acharya. He, he, he shows us the highest perfection of devotion in the line of, of the six, uh, sorry, in the line of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Raghunath Das Goswami, he announces to the world what is the highest aspiration and an, an achievement for a Gaudiya Vaishnava, for a follower of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What is that highest achievement? He announces this in his prayers and in his poems, in his poetic expressions at the very end of his life. He, he announces this and therefore he is known as the uh, Prayojan Acharya. So what is that perfection? What is that highest perfection of any Gaudiya Vaishnava? Anyone venture to say offhand? It is the thing that Prabhupada saw in his father when he was a boy, but did not recognize in him until he had become a disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. There was something in Prabhupada's father that later, as a disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, as a, as a Gaudiya Vaishnava, then Prabhupada could understand, oh, my father was pure devotee of Krishna. When he was growing up, he had no such understanding of pure devotee of Krishna or not, his father. His father was a father. He used to get him to buy not just one toy gun, but two toy guns. And all the things that a boy begs from his father when going through the market. Huh? But as an adult, as a disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, then he came to note one very special thing in his father that then he boldly wrote in the Krishna book, dedicating, <coughs> excuse me, dedicating this book, we call the Krishna book, to his father, Gormohande, a pure devotee of Krishna. But if you study Gormohande's life, then in Calcutta alone, there are three million such pure devotees of Krishna. They worship Krishna at home, and they go to the shop, and they come back, and they, they visit temples, and they give some gifts to sadhus, and they do different things like this. So, what is it that distinguishes his father different from so many other Hindu gentlemen raising their family in a pious India close to a hundred years ago? It is that very thing which is announced by Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das Goswami, he announced that our highest aspiration is to aspire in the line of service to Srimati Radharani. It is called Radha Dasyam, service of Srimati Radharani. It supersedes even service to Krishna. And this Prabhupada's, fa uh, this, Prabhupada's father was doing all along when Prabhupada was a boy. You'll read in, uh, in uh, uh, Satsrup Maharaj's uh, recollections, what is it called, the book? The Lila Amrita. Prabhupada is telling, my father used to gather many sadhus. And he would take care of them and so many, even he would give them a hookah. A hookah, you know what a hookah is? A hookah is a pipe. Well, that was the social custom. That was the order of the day. Now it's low-fat yogurt. <laughs> but in the old, those days, so many sadhus of different types, and what the sadhus that have a hookah, they offer the hookah. If Maharaj Chaitanya offers me a hookah, you will all get up and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> He's bogus, hookah. But Prabhupada's father had a hookah and offered the sadhus. Uh, that was a basic idea. What the sadhu well, he wants, they'll be happy. Then. Uh, of course, he would give them ladu, puri, sabji, very, very nice. And then he would ask a benediction, some ashiwad, some blessing. He would ask. And what did he ask? What did Prabhupada's father ask? Those sadhus. Generally, those of us who know India very well, it's 
health, wealth, a green card. <laughs> These types of things people are always asking. Last winter, after having a program in this one house, every Saturday for three months, one of the regular attendants and their family, they're very, very nice, but they came. Oh, Maharaj, please bless Piyush. He's going to, for exam, he should high score. He should get high score. I said, my blessings have nothing to do with high scores. With my blessing, you'll fail. <laughs> I'm not a scholar. I have no scholar blessings. But people generally want that. But what Prabhupada would ask? Please bless my son that he will become a devotee of Srimati Radharani and spread her glories all over the world. So, as a youth, this made some sense, but little to no sense, in a sense, so to speak. Then, when Prabhupada met his eternal master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, then everything came into clear purpose. What is his purpose in this world? What he will do? Well, this is all going on in the plane of Leela of the eternal, uh, eternally liberated souls. Uh, some people think that when they're born, they're in their mother's arms, thinking, well, I'm just waiting to start my movement, rocking in their mother's arms. No. Then they're acting as a child. Prabhupada used to laugh and talk about his Maya. He used to call it his Maya. He was a follower of Gandhi. And when he said that, we would say, oh, Prabhupada, there are you, no Maya for you. But he would laugh. Hmm? So even a liberated soul comes into this world. He does not manifest, in most cases, why he's come here until he makes a connection with the line of Mahaprabhu, that descending line of the Supreme Lord. And making that connection, then things come down to him and are revealed, what is your purpose here? What is your mission here? So, that is the, uh, that is the announcement of Raghunath Das Goswami, that uh, he, he has announced in his writings, in his prayers, his deep, heartfelt aspiration for the service of Radharani. You all know Radhakund, and you know many people come to Radhakund. And these days and, and in past times also many people come and they do what is called Dandabhat Parikram of Radhakund. They go by uh, full Dandabhats, put one stone, walk to the place of the stone, again go down and offering prayers in this way they go around Radhakund. It takes a couple of hours, just Radhakund. Radhakund Dandabhats. So one day in the old days the king of Bharatpur came. And the king of Bharatpur with his royal family was doing Dandabhat Parikram of Radhakund. Then the, the personal servant of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, who happened to be there at that time, he came running to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and he told, Oh, Guru Maharaj, the Dewan of Bharatpur has come. And with the whole family, they're doing Parakram of Radhakund. And he said, it is, it is wonderful that they have such devotion for Srimati Radharani to do this. Then uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, he shocked everyone there. He said, actually, their devotion is just the opposite of ours, he said. They have heard that Radharani is dear to Krishna. And they are focused on Krishna. But they have heard Radharani is dear to Krishna, so they are coming to honor Radharani. He said, ours is just the opposite. The only reason we have any interest in Krishna is because he is dear to Radharani. This side, we are on this side, not on that side. When you've gone through the whole thing, you realize, oh, we're Sudha Shaktas. Uh, we are worshippers of the energy of Godhead, the devote, uh, devotional energy of Godhead. If you don't believe it, then just start reading Prabhupada's books carefully, and you'll find that that's what it's all about. The whole of the Srimad Bhagavatam is to present one thing, only one thing, and that is that Radharani is the foremost servant of Krishna. Radharani alone is the one who can please Krishna. She is the mother of devotional energy. And as a jiva soul, our highest attainment is to come in a line of service in the descending line of her grace. That is known as the Chaitanya Saraswat Parampara. The Parampara that we are in. If you go through the list, who are they? Who is Mahaprabhu? Who is Gadadhar? Who are all these persons? And then you come to the six Goswamis, and who they are. Rupa, Sanatan, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami. They are all those gopi people who came down here in the form of Rupa and Sanatan. All, since then, all the way 
to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, all of the Acharyas in our line, who they are in eternal Leela of Krishna, it is known up to the time of Bhakti Siddhanta. After that, it is not known who any of them were. But you will find it in throughout our books, various letters, just like once somebody wrote, what did they say? They wrote Srila Prabhupada and they said something about it. One of the Astashakis that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta is an Astashaki. And then uh, Prabhupada wrote back and told, these are very high topics and they are not for general discussion. But as far as I know, my Guru Maharaj is not one of the Astashakis. He is Manjari, named Nayana Mani Manjari. You follow? So up to that point, who they are in that eternal world, that has been revealed. But after that point, it has not been revealed. Um, and I offer no explanation for that, other than it is a fact. It has not been revealed after that, who any of them uh, have been since that time till now. But it is clear that the line of service that is brought down by them goes to a particular place. It doesn't go to Vaikuntha. If someone offered you the chance to go to Vaikuntha today, would you take it? Vaikuntha. Eternal life in Vaikuntha. Best say no. Because, as I, would, as I tell the Joyce, because Prabhupada is not there to greet you. He is not in Vaikuntha. Mahaprabhu is not there to greet you. Nityananda Prabhu. Achutananda, the Sangratan, they're not there to greet you in Vaikuntha. Maybe Advaita Acharya. And then he would say, what are you doing here? <laughs> move on, move on. There was recently a debate, a debate or discussion. Can Advaita Acharya give Brajabhav? I don't know if you devotees see the internet every once in a while, but there was a conflict with some devotees because everyone was so inter very interested in Brajabhav. So someone was saying that Advaita Acharya cannot give you Brajabhav because he's Sadashiva Mahavishnu. He's Mahavishnu and Sadashiva. But uh, Advaita Acharya brought Mahaprabhu down to this world. Then he turns us over to Nityananda Prabhu, you see. Oh yes, he does not give the direct introduction into Vrindavan, but he gives introduction to Mahaprabhu. He brings Mahaprabhu to this world and he gives introduction to Nityananda Prabhu. And Nityananda Prabhu, he will take us uh, to Mahaprabhu. And then Mahaprabhu, and it, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, it, is, it doesn't stop there, but according to uh, a devotee's service mentality, just as Raghunath Das Goswami, he will be turned over to a particular leader of servitors. As Das Goswami, he made it all the way to the lotus feet of Mahaprabhu. Then Mahaprabhu said, you'll be with Rup Dhamnar, you'll be under his care. So in the eternal world, we will be under the care of different devotees of the Supreme Lord, according to our devotional aptitude. The, uh, you, sometimes I like to call it achievement, a devotional achievement. That achievement is just a feeling. It's just a feeling. In the end, Krishna consciousness is just about cultivating a feeling. All that you know in this world will vanish at the time of death. Everything goes. And this big feeling overwhelms us. That's what we feel the most. Darkness comes, sound goes away. There's a feeling. Hmm? So for those who are not God conscious, that feeling is all about matter. It's all about anxiety. That feeling is all about fear, attachment, and all these things. But for a devotee, that feeling is all about love. Hmm? Bhava, love, prema, the feelings of love towards Krishna. Uh, so they are as they are in this world. There's different types of love. Love with friends, love with family. Love with a lover. That's the, the kama, the, the, that worldly love. The pure love of Krishna, it also has such flavor as friend, as, uh, as a son, uh, as lover. Different types of feelings are there, different types of love. According to one's qualification in that way, then one will go uh, in a particular group of servitors. So if you were offered liberation, even to Vaikuntha, don't take it. If, if you were offered Brahma Jyoti, Certainly you wouldn't take that. You'd, you'd shoot that down right away, right? Or mystic powers. But then again, mystic powers might be all right for a little while, right? <laughs> <laughs> we could materialize some new Sankirtan vans and a few other things that we might need. But uh, actually, no, we don't want mystic power. No, we don't, we don't want um, 
uh, impersonal liberation. And we don't want Vaikuntha liberation either. We don't want that place. Uh, we must bow our head and say, no, we don't want Vaikuntha. I'll wait. I'll wait for, for the time when, when an opportunity comes down that I will serve my Lord in Goloka. Uh, or in Navadweep. Hmm? Sometimes we forget. Navadweep. Hmm? Generally, we think Goloka is everything. And, oh, yeah, and also Navadweep. This is nice. Navadweep is also there. But actually, Navadweep is more wonderful than Goloka. Goloka Vrindavan is, is called Madhu. It is sweet. But Navadweep is sweetness with magnanimity. In Vrindavan, the magnanimity is very less. One must be highly qualified there. It is very restricted. It is not open to everyone and everyone, and anyone. Magnanimity is less. But Chaitanya Leela, Navadweep, the eternal Navadweep, that is Madhurya, Madhu, sweetness, and magnanimity. It is actually greater. You have a cup full of nectar, and then you have another cup which is overflowing the nectar. One cup full of nectar, that is Krishna Leela. And one cup full of nectar and overflowing, that is Chaitanya Leela. So actually we should give more importance to Chaitanya Leela, in our meditation, in our, our contemplation, our thought, we should give more importance to Chaitanya Leela than we do to Krishna Leela. Not neglect Krishna, not neglect Vrindavan, but no entrance into Vrindavan without Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, actually. Yeah, in the, in the Renaissance period, many kings, even the king of Burma came in uh, uh, Burma? Yeah, even the king of Rangoon. He built a, a Radha Krishna temple near, near, near Gopeshwar Mahadev, you know, right next to Brindakunj, near Bhutgali, near the Gwalior mm -hmm. temple. There's one old temple built there by even some. What he knows about this Krishna Bhakti? He doesn't know very much, but it became a very cultural renaissance. It came to a point that even the Sri Vaishnavas of South India, they had to come up and build a big temple in Vrindavan, because if you're not in Vrindavan, you're nowhere. You're nobody. You see? It's like if you're into films, then you will be at the Cannes Film Fest, or you're nobody. You, you'll be at the Sundance Film Fest, or you're nobody in the film world. You see? And Vrindavan became such a place that you're not represented in Vrindavan, what you are in spiritual life. Nothing. Oh, that almost became a thing of prestige. What does prestige got to do with spiritual life? Nothing. So there's been a lot of this also going on in Vrindavan. Actually, the real thing is, only by the grace of the foot dust of Mahaprabhu and his followers, then we can enter Vrindavan. Huh? Not by just buying land, not by getting a, a big throne for ourselves, getting be, be, prestige and honor for ourselves, and so many things like that. Hmm? There is a... Uh, uh, what is it? Oh, Mother Sachi, she used to wonder, from time to time, she would wonder deeply, what is the position of her son? Adwaitacharya used to come down and, to her house and offer obeisances to that boy. And Adwaitacharya was the most uh, dignified scholar, in the uh, Vaishnav scholar, in the a whole of the uh, Navadrit Mandal. Mm -hmm. And he used to come and bow down in front of the uh, Mahaprabhu when he was a baby. So this used to trouble her mind. This, was, uh, this, will, this is very bad for my son. This is very bad. This was not good. Such a high person bowing down to my son, this is very bad. So throughout Mahaprabhu's life, she used to wonder in many ways why things are happening, why people are doing, and sometimes wonder who he is. But Yoga Maya would eventually always cover her, and she'd then just be charmed by the beauty of her child or the youthful movements of her son and so forth. So once, you know, if we think about something a lot, then generally we have dreams about that. So... Uh, once, Mother Sachi had a dream, and what she saw in the dream is that, uh, actually first there, were, there was two things. First, Nityananda Prabhu, he came to uh, Navadweep, and after the meeting of Mahaprabhu, then uh, w uh, meeting with Mahaprabhu, then Nityananda Prabhu, he announced, I have come from Vrindavan. I have just come from Vrindavan, but the thrones are empty. The Lord is not to be found in Vrindavan. He has taken his birth in Navadvi. The thrones are empty. So this, this assurance he gave to the devotees, that the Krishna of Braj has become our Lord here in Navadvi, posing as a devotee. 
but he is non-different than the Krishna of Braj. And Krishna of Braj, he's gone. And until Mahaprabhu went there, almost gone. That Krishna Braj all hidden away. After Mahaprabhu, Krishna went back to Vrindavan. Then the temples, then the deities came back and they were manifest. There were only a few that were still visible. Then so many manifested. So first Nityananda Prabhu announced that Vrindavan is empty. The Lord has come to Navadri. So then later, Mother Sachi had the dream. And in her dream, she saw Krishna and Balaram on a throne in Vrindavan. Then Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu came there. And then uh, Nityananda Prabhu, he, he told, you get off the throne. Your time is over. Come down. My Lord, Goranga is here. Your time is over. Come down. <laughs> and, and then Balaram said, what do you say? Huh? This is my brother Krishna. He is Lord of Vrindavan. He will always be on this throne. He cannot know it. No, your time is over. Come. And then Nityananda Prabhu began to fight with Balaram. And he pulled them off the throne. <laughs> pulled them down from the throne. This throne is meant for Goranga in Kali Yuga. Goranga is on the throne. So, <clears throat> it's like a circle. Once it gets going in a circle, uh, where's the point of starting? It's a circle. It just keeps going and going and going. So generally, there is... But we, we should move with the flow. You see, we should move with the flow and we should understand the importance of Navadvip, Chaitanya Leela, how that will take us in a deeper connection with, with Krishna Leela. And in a deeper connection with Krishna Leela, we will find a deeper appreciation for Chaitanya Leela. And it begins to go in a circle, and pretty soon you become a madman. You have read it? In the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, Prabhupada said the purpose, the goal, is to become mad in love of Krishna. Become mad. Are you ready to become a madman? Are you ready to become a slave? Because there are no servants of God. There are only slaves of God. Even service isn't profound enough. Why? Because service you can withdraw. Oh, why? I don't like it. I'll go back. But if I own this, I own this, Loda, where I can go? Nowhere. It is mine. I own it. It is my property. Similarly, the devotees, they are owned by Krishna. They are his energy. They are his property. So even service isn't quite a strong enough servant, is not quite strong enough to really bring it home. And when people hear slave, it's like, oh my God, what is this gentleman saying? It is such a bad thing. Yes, in this world, slavery is the worst of things. But everything just the opposite there. A slave of love, nothing could be finer. Nothing could be sweeter. Nothing is more rewarding than to be a slave in love of the Supreme Lord. So, uh, what is the point there? Um, uh, what happened? You were talking about Radharani from, from uh, Tanda's land. Uh, something about Mahaprabhu. Oh, Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. Mahaprabhu. The Vedicharya. Uh -huh. The dream. Mm. Oh, so, now, <clears throat> Both sides, Krishna, the, oh yes, there. So I, I, I said about becoming mad. So it is said that there are actually three types of madmen in this Krishna consciousness movement. Be a mad man, mad woman. But three types. Those are very much favorable to Krishna Leela, very much drawn to Krishna. Krishna Leela, Radha Krishna. <clears throat> Those who are very attracted to Gaur Leela. Uh, Gornitai, Gorgadada, or Panchatava, Chaitanya Lila, and those who are drawn to both. Mm -hmm. The destination of those souls is also accordingly. Mm -hmm. If one is drawn towards Krishna Lila and can reach that perfection of love in this life, then you rise uh, to become an eternal resident in Goloka. Mm -hmm. If one is more given to Chaitanya Lila, then he may become an eternal resident in the Navadvip section of Goloka. But if he is equally mad for both, as is in the case with many devotees, then the soul will live in two worlds at once. He will be in two places at once. That place is nothing like this place. We say it's a reflection. That is, that, that is after we've stretched the imagination. There is practically nothing here like that. 
Everything here is limited. Even, the, even when we say the infinite, our concept of infinite, that is limited. You see. Here, how many people can sit in a room? 20, 25, 30, pretty soon, it's full. If this room is any given room in uh, Goloka, then one lakh, 100,000 cowherds could sit in this room together. No pushing, no shoving. No lack of space. Why? Because that space is in infinite. It is infinite space. This is finite space. Therefore, in a gallon jug, you can only put, what is it, 32 ounces. You can't put 100 ounces in a gallon jug because 30, that space is limited. But that much space in the spiritual world could hold all the oceans of the material world. Or just pouring that jug, you could fill up those oceans many times over. Infinite it's not very big, it's infinite. It's more than big. We generally think of the infinite as just the biggest one, biggest yet, and a little bigger than that, but big isn't even word. You know, isn't even the proper word. No limitations there. Sometimes we find in Chaitanya Leela that people are not just one person from that spiritual world, they're three persons. Ramananda Roy, he is considered as Arjuna, who was the Pandava, he is considered as uh, Vishaka, as in Lalita Vishaka, Radha Krishna, and also he is considered as a cowherd boy named Arjuna. Three. He is considered as a three in one, so to speak. So even we're saying, I'm not this body, even we're saying, I'm spirit soul, all these things are quite intellectual for us. The experience is waiting. Uh, and the experience is mostly found on the other side, entering in the world where nothing is matter. We say we're not this body, but we begin every day by waking up, which is a function of the body, waking up. And we do everything through the day in relation to this body. You see, We even stop chanting Hare Krishna when we are tired. You see, We even take prasadam when we are hungry. Why don't you take it when you're not hungry? It, it, well, we do that too, actually. <laughs> That's sometimes our problem, right? The point is that we are, we are working with a theory. Krishna is God. We say theory, not like modern theory. It's not a theory that has no, no, no experience. But the, the, the bulk of that experience is waiting there. You see. Now, in these modern days, Many devotees are very uh, uh, given to Krishna Leela. Uh, and they want always to talk about Krishna Leela. And they want always to talk about the uh, Madhurya Leela within, within Krishna. And they even sometimes uh, criticize uh, book distribution, different types of, not different types, but overall Sankirtan, sometimes even preaching. Mm -hmm. They criticize that in favor of just bhajan, just doing bhajan. But these persons, what, what we say is, these persons have overlooked something very, very important. That this Sankirtan movement is the Leela of Mahaprabhu. It's not something else that we're doing. It is the uh, activity of Mahaprabhu. In other words, like a rug, if you take it and you go like this, this wave starts across the rug, right? It's just a ripple, right? Oh, because sometimes it ends. Right? But this Sankirtan movement, it hasn't ended since the day it began. Mahaprabhu, he gave that wave, the Sankirtan. He inaugurated the Sankirtan. Sometimes Prabhupada used to give report that he is dancing in that Sankirtan. It is going on eternally also in Navadvip. I heard once from one of the oldest disciples of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. He said, in the beginning when nothing was here at Mayapur, we used to live with our guru, and in the middle of the night, we would hear some kirtan, some, some sankirtan. We could hear the kartals murdanga, the chanting. Uh, and Guru Maharaj used to say, that is the eternal sankirtan of Mahaprabhu. Now at Mayapur, you also hear something, but that is someone's loudspeaker blaring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And probably it's a Sahajiya Kirtan coming from Shrupa Ganj across the river, 
or just a wedding sound or something. So many sounds are filling there. Sound pollution. We say sound pollution. But the eternal pastimes of Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement going on. And this Sankirtan movement that we have become a part of by joining into Krishna consciousness, this is not something, some lesser thing. This is actually that wave that was started by Mahaprabhu. And he told this wave will go to every town and village of the world for many, 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 many centuries. Some people say, or what the Bansam Purana says, 10,000 years it may go on. It may even exceed that also. It may exceed that. This wave is said that it will even reach to higher planetary systems. So Sankirtan Leela, Prabhupada wrote, is Rasa Leela. Sankirtan Leela is Rasa Leela. It is non-different. If you want Krishna, the, the meaning is this. If you want Krishna, then give yourself fully in cooperation to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Enter through the Sankirtan movement. Entering in the Sankirtan, we are immediately engaged in the Lord's pastimes. You follow. Even though here in this world we have so many less qualifications, we are not fit for that, but that is his magnanimity. You are not fit for that, but will you accept this gift? We say yes, then you have it. And we can uh, uh, enter into the Lord's pastimes with Sankirtan. And then, Sankirtan means service. Hmm? Service. The pot washer is also in the Sankirtan movement. The bookkeeper is in the Sankirtan movement. The book printer is in the Sankirtan movement. The, uh, the preacher, the Bhagavatam preacher, the college preacher, the Murdunga player, the Kartal player. Uh, ideally, it should be even those who take care of the children. They are also in the Sankirtan movement. Prabhupada's conception was well, there was no Maya in the movement. Everything is in the Sankirtan movement. Having children is in the Sankirtan movement. Raising children is in the Sankirtan. It is all about a Sankirtan movement. Huh? So there are so many services in the Sankirtan movement. These services are most essential for our progress and our advancement. Huh? The thing you eat three times a day, the thing that Prabhu brought on a plate, prashadam. What is prashadam? What is our realization of prashadam? Sometimes in taking Prashana, Mahaprabhu would become very emotional. Uh, sometimes he would become very anxious and shout. Uh, he would shout about that Prashadam. Oh, it is tasted by Krishna. Sometimes he would shed tears. Sometimes he would become choked up. Uh, and sometimes all at once, everything. Uh, he is taking Prashadam. Hmm? But we are taking Prashadam for granted. It is food. That is our mistake. Or we are taking Prashadam for enjoyment. That is our even bigger mistake. Hmm? No, maybe not bigger, but that is also a mistake. Hmm? I think it is uh, Upadesha Amrita. I don't know which verse. Maybe first verse. I forget. But Srila Prabhupada writes there that if one takes Maha Prashadam to satisfy his senses just for the taste of it, then he'll fall victim of the senses. Maya. Be captured by Maya. Maha Prashadam. It is Maha Prashadam, but it has been spoiled. We are captured by, victim of, we have victimized ourselves with the enjoying spirit. So prashadam is honored. Prashadam is honored. Once Prabhupada's plate came out of his room in Vrindavan, and uh, I said, yes, I don't mind if I do. And I just went to take a raskula that was sitting on Prabhupada's plate. And a servant just moved the plate. And I was like, hey, what are you doing? I'm a sannyasi. Why do you think I got this dunda? <laughs> this is it re anyway? Then he picked up the rascula and he just crumbled it into the doll and just dropped it into the doll. Then he took the sweet rice and poured that in the doll. And, he, and I just said, whatever. And I just sat there watching him and he turned it all into the thing. And then he poured it on the plate and he went like this. And it all went, you know, if you've been an Indian, you know, it went that yellowy green color. Everything just became that yellowy, turmeric, dull, green color. Then he scooped up a scoop. I said, yes, I will. And I took one scoop of that Mahaprasadam. And I was in my mind, I was thinking, whatever. And then he said, he saw my light, wonder. He told, Prabhupada told me yesterday to do this to his Mahaprasadam. Otherwise, devotees will eat it just for sense gratification. And then from that day, for the next seven or eight months, 
Prabhupada's Mahaprasadam was only distributed in that way, mixed like this. So, of course, we don't just, okay, smoosh everything, everything like this. People think we're mad, you see. But sometime, some particular thing will descend in the company of very high and genuine Vaishnavas, and then that, that will be followed. Maybe not for all time, but for that time following in a particular mood or some instruction is given there. So the instruction was not, make sure you mush all the prashadam together. That's not the instruction. The instruction is, do not become the enjoyer. Remember, it is Krishna's mercy. Somebody asked me how you became a devotee. I said, prashad. And they thought, oh, it's, you know, Maharaj's old, old devotee must have been some high philosophical points or something. I said, no, I became a devotee for prashadam, and I remain a devotee because of prashadam. Well, what is prashadam? It is the Lord's mercy. I became a devotee by his mercy. I remain a devo devotee by his mercy. Independent of his mercy, finished, gone. So how we can keep always the mercy of the Supreme Lord is to catch the feet of the devotees. Catch the feet of his dear devotees. That is our best way to access his, his mercy. So, Hare Krishna, go I don't want to just go on and on. I know that uh, you have different uh, agendas, being that this is the middle of the week or something. Or... So I'll just stop, and if there are any questions. We are enjoying your... Just see. He's enjoying. <laughs> yeah. um, hmm. Hmm. Oh. So since we touched upon that, if, if I am asked what is the most uh, important thing you think that could be done <clears throat> for the devotees in general to improve upon the Krishna consciousness movement as it is today, I would say, and I did say last week when I was asked this, that the devotees should, according, their, according to their capacity, try to develop a deeper understanding of even those things which are seemingly very ordinary. You see. Uh, I'm a plain speaking type of a person. I don't calculate uh, any, what do you call it? Uh, not politics, but... Uh, yeah, some like, something I should say because it will get a certain result. I try to say something that's very truthful. Um, I have heard in the greater ISKCON movement that women clamor to be called Prabhu. But actually all devotees are called Prabhu. But you should clamor. Call me your servant. Call me your dog. Why you want to be called master? Hey, call me master, eh? Call me master. Where did we learn this? Call me master. Call me your dog. Call me your servant. Huh? But we lose sight of this. What, what we are looking for, what? What type of, in the association, I met Prabhupada's sister. I'm a, I was a sannyasi, that time young sannyasi. I offered my obeisances to Prabhupada's sister, Pishima. Um, and, uh, uh, and we also told old Prabhu, we may have addressed her as Prabhu, but uh, she, was, she had no demand to be called Prabhu. You see, we, we demand to be in the front, and then later we demand to be in the back. The problem is demand, you see. Actually, women are so close to Krishna consciousness by birth, by life, by society. They are much closer to Krishna consciousness than men. It's that last little step that's so hard. It's like, it's, 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 it's usually the life most of us don't get into. We're very, very old. What's that? You're looked after. You're given service. You don't have to be involved in argument. You have so many things. You can actually live what is the real life of a devotee. Humble, serving others. So many people get the chair. You see, the chair would say in India, the chair. They get the plaque, you see. They get the zone. These things have sent hundreds of devotees to the grave, you see. Just like when there's a war, 
we don't, at least in old days, you don't tell the women, okay, grab the bayonets and go. You know, it's like, no, that wouldn't happen, you see. So why do you want to fight for that bayonet? You can get killed out there. But in your natural position in society, you're protected, and it's so easy to become Krishna conscious from there because it's, it is the position of a servant. The men, they run the risk of thinking they're in charge. They're not in charge of anything. Nobody's controlling anything. Everything, everybody is simply trying to whittle down the ego and come to who they are. I'm a servant. I'm a servant of Krishna. And to, 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 to actually be that, I, I must be servant of his devotees. Servant, we should only hear this thing, call me servant, call me servant, not call me Prabhu. That is a spiritual defect, you see. We clamor for things, we want things that are not good for us. You see. So we should understand what does it mean to be a servant, the deeper understanding of things. Um, what, as I mentioned earlier, what is prasadam? What is the holy name? Even if you're going to crash, Hare Krishna, that's Namabhas. You're just about to die, and you chant Hare Krishna. That's Namabhas. That's not Sudhanam. Sudhanam, you would have already been chanting Hare Krishna. You wouldn't have just shouted it because you thought you were going to die. When, if you look, study closely, Prabhupada explains, all Acharyas have explained, one shouting the name in fear. And that is called Namabhas. Namabhas may even give liberation, but be careful. You could end up in Vaikuntha. <laughs> Only Sudhanam gives love of Krishna, and only those with love of Krishna go to Goloka, and there is Prabhupada. There in Goloka. There is Navadvip. There is Mahaprabhu. There are your lords, which you're worshipping in your temple. They're not in Vaikuntha. They're eternally in, 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 in that world. Oh, well, what is the holy name? All the things that we do in Krishna consciousness, they should, we should take them. We are not for awe and reverence. But we should deal with all things in Krishna consciousness very reverentially, you see. The Achman cup, do you know what it is? It's an expansion of an antasasya. So how, should, how you will wash it and how you will place it in the drying rack when you're finished. <laughs> Just throw it in, you know, with some disregard to that spoon and that metal cup. You will deal with that in any which way. No, it is the Lord's paraphernalia. It is a spiritual expansion of ananta. You should deal with that in a most regardful way. You see, but a lot of times we, we, we try to enter into that, we become a little imbalanced in that too. We, we get a little weird. <laughs> Nonetheless, the opposite side, just dealing with everything as it has no, no substance, no meaning, everything is just a rollover and it's happening, that's a mistake. The holy name, most particularly, how we deal with the holy name. Practically, we're ready to cut someone's uh, whatever, allowance at least if they don't chant 16 rounds a day. But over the year, the no the, it is the number that has risen to prominence. We forgot the other part of the sentence. You know, like in Christianity, they quote one part of the paragraph and not the second. Srila Prabhupada said, chant 16 offenseless rounds every day. And when he says offenseless, he's not meaning namabhas, because namabhas is the offenseless stage of chanting. He means sudhanam, because he is not about a movement of namabhas and simply liberation, you see. He is about a movement of love of God. And love of God only comes through sudhanam. So when he says offenseless, he means chant purely. So, and he has said, if you can chant one name purely, that may be your, that will, not maybe, that is perfection. And six, so we should endeavor for purity, not just for numbers. And you know when he, when he reached New York, he said 64 rounds. That was his first request. Chant 64 offenseless rounds every day. The first devotees, when they first started, they were asked to chant 64 rounds. They couldn't do it. But here in this, this civilization, immediately you better be out there early to meet the rush hour or be in the rush hour. There's so many demands in this world. So then he thought, okay, 32 rounds a day. And this they could also not keep up. Then Prabhupada said, okay, 16 rounds a day and a, a full day of service. You see, Fully engaged in service. Huh? 
then 16 rounds, but not just a number, you see. And if one can do more chanting, that is also very nice. So all the things that we do have a deep connection to Krishna. Nothing is just ordinary, not even your dress. Do you know if you are a real follower of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, you should offer your clothes first to the deity, then you should wear that cloth. This was followed in early ISKCON temples, I remember in 1972. In Denver, we used to buy all this cloth. It was always synthetic cloth. You know, and we'd buy these big bolts of cloth for the, for the brahmacharis, the brahmacharinis, the householders, we'd buy all this cloth, and then we'd carry it in and we'd offer it to Lord Jagannath. And it would stay there for an hour during his rest or something like that. And then there'd be a big cutting it up party and there would be dhotis and saris and everything for everything. It was offered. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote this actually in one of his last books. He said, I will only wear as cloth that which is the remnants of Lord Jagannath. So he only takes cloth which is offered to Jagannath. So maybe we don't do every one of these things, but there we should, uh, as I say, even down to our clothing, try to enter into a more conscious awareness of what we are dealing with. One of the defects is we have arranged the life and we deal with it objectively. It is, there are two types of dealings, objective and subjective. It's a little bit of a subtle zone to understand, but basically it, uh, objective is you work hard and you earn a living, and subjective is you just got an inheritance, $10 million. Huh? Subjective means it just comes down to you. Krishna consciousness is only subjective. Our endeavor doesn't actually produce Krishna. We have some minimal endeavor, but ultimately it must come down from him. Love of God is situated in the heart, but no matter how hard you work on it, it doesn't come out. What you have to do or what I have to do is clean all around that, clean out the anarthas, work on that process of purification, cleaning the heart. And that is an independent substance. It will grow of its own. It is not of this conditioned world. Prema, love of God, is of that world. And it will come down and it will fill the heart of any person who has made his heart suitable for a residence of Krishna. In the pastimes of Gundicha, cleaning of Gundicha, Prabhupada explains there in the end according to the purport of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. What is this? Gundicha is Vrindavan, and we want Krishna to bring him to Vrindavan. Mahaprabhu wants to take Krishna to Vrindavan. So first he cleans uh, Gundicha. Three times he cleans? Twice or three times he cleans the Gundicha temple to show that we must come to the point of Anartha Nivriti. We must purify the heart of so many misgivings if we want to uh, uh, offer a seat to Krishna. If we want that love of Krishna to enter the heart, we must, uh, uh, we must purify ourselves. So Krishna consciousness is subjective. But we are dealing with everything very objectively. Technically, you should not even serve yourself prasadam. Technically. If it can be arranged, you should not smorgasbord style prasadam. All right, Christmas marathon and so many things are going on. And sometimes we make changes because it's practical. But what happens is that change just sticks forever. And that becomes a standard. Prashadam should be given. Prashadam is also not to be served by bhaktas. Prashadam is actually only to be served by initiated devotees. Who can serve the Lord's mercy to another living being? Somebody off the street just came in? Well, come on, serve prashadam. Oh, it's not possible. Do you think you could just catch anybody? Come on, serve Prabhupada Prashadam? No, only the sannyasis, only the older ladies, older grihasta men, older devotees. And if someone is in Maya, they going to serve Prabhupada Prashadam? No. Only some devotee of some devotional status. So Prashadam is not just there, what it is. There's also the act of giving that. For example, if you go there sometime and Prabhupada is there, huh? And uh, he's on the Vyasa and handing out cookies. Maybe you got a cookie from him when you were a kid. And also the temple president, he's at the door. 
Oh, don't worry, but I'll give you one cookie. I'll be back for this one later, and you'll go there. What? What is it just because you can say you got a cookie from Prabhupada and all that? No, that's not what it is. Why? Because that is the Lord's mercy being given out by the Lord's devotee. So you have the double potency there. You see, the Lord's mercy, the Lord, temple president, also the Lord's devotee. But we'll take opportunity when available to connect with the higher devotees, and then uh, this will be very good for us. So, um, uh, in the old days, in the Gaudiya tradition, a Brahmin doesn't change his own Brahmin's thread. He has to uh, remove one thread as, an, as a Brahmin puts on a thread. Hmm? And then, uh, also, japa. Say his japa beads are lost. Okay, You go to the market and buy a pair. Go to the temple store and buy a pair. Right? So, in the old days, then a devotee, he will take those new beads to some respected devotee, which he feels genuine respect for. Uh, it may be a higher, much higher devotee. It may be his guru. It may be his guru's godbrother. It may be his own godbrother or godsister. But he will take the beads there and ask for, please bless my beads. He doesn't just take from the shopkeeper at 90 or 108 rupees, you see, and start chanting on his beads. Now, if you watch what happens to devotees when they lose their beads in Vrindavan, what do they do? They take them to the Jamuna and they offer them to the Shantaras section. Jamuna is a Shantaras bhakta. But they, 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 the idea is like, mm, these beads just came from the market. Let me sanctify them. So they all go to the Jamuna. But those who have more faith, that faith will tell them, go to a Vaishnava, ask him to sanctify those beads. That will be better than even putting them into the Jamuna. But you can see, just in the regular movements, we feel that we've got these beads. Now what do we do with them? We want to purify them. We want to sanctify them. So we take them to something holy. There is nothing more holy than a Vaishnava. They even purify places like Vrindavan. They purify the holy places. If we go to Vrindavan, we feel one of two things. Either we're fired up or disgusted, or both. I wanted to talk to you after. There is a McDonald's opened in Vrindavan. Full-fledged McDonald's. Ronald McDonald, 35 feet tall, Full golden arches, a car park for at least a hundred cars, floodlights at night, music. It's just a little outside Mathura. It's still in the Brajamandal. Yeah. Yeah. You see? Terrible. Nobody has said a word. It's been there almost a year and a half. No one has said a peep anywhere. Anyway, that's a separate subject. But what are they saying? Are they disgusted or fired up? Oh, yeah. So we're either disgusted or fired up. So we see that, we're disgusted. Oh, we see Krishna Balaram temple and these things, we're fired up. But what does Prabhupada say? He, if you read, again, I started by saying, look closely, pay attention. Everything is there in a minute detail. But mostly, psh, we're going right over it, you see. Like I sent Govardhan into the room to find something, the other, and he went and ran in his room three times. And then I went in the room and picked up a box, and it was right under the box. Be thorough. Be very thorough when you read Prabhupada's books. Pay attention. There, I forget exactly where. He says, when the pure devotees go to Vrindavan, they feel great separation from Krishna. When the pure devotee, those who are absorbed in love of Krishna, they go to Vrindavan, they feel separation of Krishna. And we're piling off the bus, yo, and screaming and running to the restaurant or something. And we think we are in Vrindavan. That is not Vrindavan. That is some other place nearby, but that is not been done. <laughs> it's coming. 200 devotees will descend on this place sooner or later and put a bug in your ear that may not sound very good to you or you may not like. And that's part of it. They say Prabhupada only gave the ABCs, but uh, we are giving the XYZs. Uh, recently, one man said, Prabhupada only gave God, but such and such Maharaj, he is giving Rasa Leela. So about the ABCs, we say, yes, Prabhupada gave the ABCs. And Krishna says of, in Bhagavad Gita, of letters of the alphabet, I am A. You follow? So from the very beginning, <laughs> he has given Krishna. And who, or what type of gentleman are you? You don't appreciate this gift. Huh? Write on A. You didn't have to give B, A. If you can appreciate what is A. 
It is said that every sound the Bhagavatam makes is vibrating Krishna, Krishna. In a higher level, it is told that every sound the Bhagavatam makes it is vibrating the name of Radharani. But we are trying to see, what is this? What is this? What is this? We have no eyes to see there. But if we, have, if we can purify ourselves, means if we can enter deeply into this process, huh, we can accept that which is coming down, then one day we will open our eyes and we'll see, oh, it is there, it is there. We'll enter deeply into the Bhagavatam, deeply into the mystery of Krishna consciousness. We may be very happy with A. Huh? If we can actually have A, if we can even come to the plane of A, what is A? Sometimes somebody was criticizing, what were they criticizing? Some criticism of Haridas Thakur, telling he is only Shantaras Bhakta. Haridas Thakur is only in Shantara. That was what it was, right? Yeah. yeah. Haridas Thakur is only in Shantaras. But we're for Madhurya Ras. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Haridas Thakur, maybe, maybe Shantaras Bhakta. And yeah. Godi is for Madhurya Ras. But Krishna's flute also Shantaras Bhakta. And gopis are praying for the mercy of that flute. So who are you to ridicule Haridas Thakur? You pray for his mercy. Govardhan Hill is also Shantaras. Oh, why we're circumambulating in Govardhan Hill? Govardhan Hill is Shantaras Bhakta. Jamuna is Shantaras Bhakta. Why we're taking bath in Jamuna? Oh, why Krishna is taking bath? So what is Shantaras? That we also cannot properly appreciate, but we think we will qualify for Madhurya Ras. <laughs> so again, a deeper understanding of the most simple things, and Krishna is there. Krishna is everywhere. One doesn't have to go to Vrindavan to find Krishna. But if given the opportunity, please go to Vrindavan. That is something special. But Krishna is also everywhere. Just like Prabhupada used to tell about Jagannath, Lord of the universe, not Purinath, Jagannath, Lord of the universe. Jagannath also came here. He came to the Western countries. I remember, I remember, and uh, uh, for nearly 20 years here, not every time, but whenever the opportunity would come, I would attend the Rathiatras, maybe in San Francisco or Los Angeles or, or seeing the Rathiatras. I think those are the only... Oh, New York. New York, Los Angeles, Rathiatra. Excuse me. I think... Unless once in Boston. I think... Yeah. And once, do you have a Rathiatra here? Small one or something? Used to. Huh? Used to. Yeah, used to. Yeah, I, I came to that one. So those are the three or four. So then after being in devotional service for more than 20, 25 years, then I went to Jagannath Puri. I went there for Rathiatra one day. I was there when on a high uh, angle where I could see when Lord Jagannath would just come out of the gate, you see. And although he was much bigger than any Jagannath I had seen previously, it was Jagannath. I did not have the feeling, oh, the other Jagannath I saw wasn't Jagannath. Oh, this is the Jagannath. Uh, and also the Jagannath. Uh, Jagannath himself came to the Western world hmm, by his own choosing. Hmm? Uh, and, and, and has uh, very kindly giving uh, darshan uh, to uh, so many uh, hundreds, thousands of devotees, and maybe, I guess, even millions of other people here. But we should try to understand what is Jagannath? What is the Lord of the universe? What is he? What is his form? What is his mood? We should not just be happy and not, uh, just settle... No, no, we're in Rathiyatra. It is nice. It is yearly offense. And, uh, yeah, sorry, yearly offense. Yearly event. Uh, and we don't know what is uh, Jagannath. We should give attention. What is Jagannath? Where does Jagannath come from? What is Jagannath's move? What did Mahaprabhu see when he saw Jagannath? Jagannath. What is all this thing going on in Rathiyatra? What it is? What it is? What are we doing? Why has he come here? What are we being absorbed into? And sometimes we say, I don't know. There are three things that keep us from knowing. One is we don't have the qualification. We have not, uh, uh, we have not endeavored for proper purification. Uh, two, we don't have the proper uh, uh, association. What did I say the third? I said three. 
And three, we have made offenses. Because of offenses. Srila uh, Prabhupada translates Mahaprabhu's uh, prayers a very peculiar way. And same way Bhakti Vinod translated, same way Bhakti Siddhanta translated. That, oh my Lord, I have no taste for your holy name. Though you are so kind, you have, present, you have presented yourself in names like Govinda and Krishna, etc. But I have no taste for those names. And he writes, because of offenses. Because of aparad, because of offense to the holy name, we are blocked. Because of offense, we cannot enter into the deeper understanding of even prasadam or anything. Or what is Gayatri? What is Gayatri? What is Gayatri to most people is a sound. That's what Gayatri is to most people. A sound that if you say to a Brahmin, say the third line of Gayatri, um, 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 they can't even remember, although they say the Gayatri three times a day. Because they just make a sound and don't pay attention to that sound, or they are blocked in some way and they don't enter into that sound. That sound is the most profound sound uh, next to the holy name that is descended to this world. It comes directly from the flute of Krishna. Uh, it, is, it is the sound from which the Srimad Bhagavatam has risen. It has risen out of that sound. A Gayatri Mata. Uh, uh, Veda Mata. The mother of all the Vedas. The mother of the Vedanta. The mother of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Hmm? Jiva Goswami says the Bhagavatam is the purport of Gayatri Mantra. What is the Bhagavatam? We have to look deeply into these things. It's just not an anthology of so many unique stories. These stories are demonstrating things. Consciousness and uh, qualification at different levels, showing us the way, ultimately coming to uh, the Vrindavan conception. The Vrindavan conception is argue, arguable by all other Vaishnav Sampradayas. They argue the Vrindavan conception. What is that? Raga Marg. Spontaneous love. Then no, Vaidhi Marg. All other Vaishnavas, they argue Vaidhi Marg. But in Vrindavan, Raga Marg. Spontaneous love takes the highest position. And those with the highest uh, spontaneous love, they're the cowherd girls, the gopis. No, they say, no. Highest position goes to Lakshmi, awe and reverence. Only uh, Godias uh, and those who are under the influence of Godia, uh, uh, they, they, they accept these things. Vrindavan. Uh, what is that devotion of Vrindavan? What is the standard of, of that devotion in Vrindavan? Hmm? Bhagavatam takes us to Vrindavan. The flute sound of Krishna takes us to Vrindavan. What does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? In the end he says, Sarva Dharma and Prityaja Mami Kam Sananam Braja. Bhagavad Gita takes us to Vrindavan. That is called Alankar. He tells Braja. Braja means Vrindavan. You surrender into me, you come to me. And he uses this word Braja, which means you will come to me in Vrindavan. The sweetest land of divinity. The place of my playful pastimes. Huh? You will come to me in Vrindavan. Bhagavad Gita takes us to Vrindavan. It, where does it take us? Otherwise, where does it take us? To Kurukshetra? Where does it take us? It takes us to Vrindavan. Where did Prabhupada take us after he preached in this Western world for so many years? He put everybody on a plane. He took them to Vrindavan, not to Kurukshetra. You would think, well, Bhagavad Gita was spoken in Kurukshetra, and he preached Bhagavad Gita. Why didn't he take us there? No, because the Krishna is preaching at Kurukshetra is to take us to Vrindavan. Everything takes us to Vrindavan. Mahaprabhu takes us to Vrindavan. Bhagavad Gita takes us to Vrindavan. The flute sound of Krishna takes us to Vrindavan. But if we are not attentive, if we are not attentive to this, then we might find that we get lost along the way. It must be. It must be that people get lost along the way. Otherwise, they would not give up this Krishna consciousness. If they were attentive to where they were going, and they were not bothered by any offense, then they would enter more deeply into Krishna consciousness and they would not uh, find themselves wandering here and there in, in the world. So anyway, I'm sorry, but I was just getting a little uh, carried away there. Hare Krishna. Do you have any particular questions? No. See if anyone else has a question. You're always there. The eternal face behind the camera. I'll come around, you see.
Does anyone else have a question? Yes. Um, what, what's the result of offensively in the above? Money. You get more money. If you offense, if you create offenses, you may become very rich. And then when you get that money, you won't have any interest in Krishna consciousness. You'll just be carried away into so many mundane things. The greatest devotees of the world, except for a few, you can count on one hand, have always been poverty stricken. They haven't been very wealthy. Poverty is a good sign for a Vaishnava. <laughs> As we used to say, well, you can tell what God thinks of money. Look who he gives it to. Look who are the rich people. What do most of the rich people do? They, they live a very selfish life, mostly. Uh, and sometimes bizarre life. And uh, so forth. So sometimes we see that. If you've ever had a friend who is a multimillionaire, they're mostly hard to even be in a room with. They're so arrogant and all these things. Mostly rich people are plagued by wealth. So once our uh, uh, Prabhupada's godbrother, Srila Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj, he wrote in his book, Heart of Krishna, that one of the results of Vaishnava Parad is great wealth. Another result is the interest, <coughs> excuse me, the interest to perform great yagyas and to do great sacrifices. But never it is born uh, the interest to serve the Vaishnavas. Never. That is not born there. So many other uh, worldly inter in, uh, interests are born out of that Nama Bharad. Not that immediately your nose falls off with leprosy and you, you run off and, and, and forget about Krishna. No, you may, you may become very absorbed externally in Krishna consciousness, but internally, nothing. That will be blocked. That will be blocked. No real progress. False certificate will be given. Then an inspiration to live in a fool's paradise, that will be given. But Krishna will never be given. And love of Krishna will never be given. So, but it is hard to do that, you see. Mostly the chanting goes on in Nama Bas. Nama Parad. Uh, do you think Krishna is the same as Durga? No, then that's not Nama Parad. So there, there, there are the rules of what is the name. Hmm? Two things. Uh, two things, three things, two particularly, uh, one almost disturbs all devotees. Remaining materially attached to things after receiving so many instructions not to be attached. Householders being, becoming so attached to their children. Men and women becoming attached to each other's husband and wife. Too, uh, too much materially attached. Attached to wealth, attached to position. I'm the temple president. You, 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 why should there be any politics? You want to be the president? <laughs> it's yours, the whole ball of wax. <laughs> no, instead everybody's fighting for the ropes. That was nice to see. I asked these two, who's the president? They went, he is. <laughs> Probably thought I wanted to file a lawsuit right now. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that old story, right? When Prabhupada was describing the universe is so big, and then within that there are 14 planetary systems, yeah. and then and it got all the way down to Calcutta, which is this huge city in India with you know like 25 million people and you know millions of houses, and one of those houses is our temple, and there's a hundred devotees here, and one of them is thinking I'm the president. And I forget who that was at the time, but it was was it? Uh, so and so, he's thinking I'm the president. Well, what we are is only the servant. Uh, there's a nice thing in, in the Godia, uh, in the Godia Mutt, which is nice. Uh, they say President Savite means servant president. He's the head uh, head Savite Pajari. Savite means servant Pajari, servant president. And even many of their acharyas are called uh, Savite Acharya. President Savite Acharya it means the Acharya, he's also servant. He is also servant in the line, serving the mission, serving his Guru Maharaj, serving his Guru Maharaj's mission. Savite Acharya, like that. So, but all are, all are servant. So, too much material attachment, that is one offense that devotees can more easily make. Um, 
The worst one is Vaishnava Parad. Uh, that is uh, that is more uh, that is more difficult to make, but uh, we managed it anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of Vaishnava Parad has been made. One older Gaudiya Vaishnava once he said, "Yes, when your Guru Maharaj came to the West, it was a fertile field. Now the field is strewn with Vaishnava Parad." And so progress is slow. In the beginning, it was a fertile field. No, no aparad. No Vaishnava, unless somebody caring from a previous lifetime, aparad. That is also there. But no one making aparad. The devotees weren't making aparad. To have a little quarrel, the bhakta leader with the sankirtan leader, this is not Vaishnava aparad. That is, in this course of service, sometimes there will be some passionate. That is not Vaishnava aparad. Who is envious of a pure devotee, who is envious of the work of the pure devotee, and criticizes them. That is aparad. For there must be envy. Then there is aparad. Then there is Vaishnava aparad. You see. But simply, there was this story once. See, they tell this story. This brahmachari was out begging. He came to the house of this man. Whatever had happened in this man's life, uh, they don't know, but he was really upset. And as soon as he opened the door, he said, you, be- you people, you beggars, you are useful for nothing just started shouting at this brahmachari. You see, he'd come to beg, right? And, no, sir, I only came, we were collecting some money. You are beggars, you are beggars, I'll give you something. The man was so angry, just shouting kind of incoherently. Went to the kitchen, got ashes, because in those days, the, everyone cooked with wood and charcoal and cow dung and everything. He got some ashes, and he had his begging bowl. He was a disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, brahmachari. He says, here's your bhikshu, and get out. And he gave him these ashes. That devotee realized, whatever happened here, this man is just completely distressed. And just, I, I just happened to come here. You see, he didn't take it. That he's not inimical to him. Something in this man's life, all of a sudden he opens the door, you! And he just goes off, you see. So then what that devotee did, he went back to the temple, he went to the Pajaris. And he said, and he, and he put the ashes. And he said, uh, when you clean the Lord's brass, please clean it with these ashes. If you have ash, ashes from a wood fire or charcoal fire, the ash, you can polish brass with it and then wash it off and dry it. So he told them, please polish the Lord's brass. Right? Okay, so they, they have so much ash, but no, someone gave this ashes. So that man's like anxiety in the form of those ashes to that brahmachari, huh? he took that to the pajari, who then engaged that in the Lord's service. A couple of months later, another brahmachari knocked on that man's door, and when he opened the door and he saw, then that man said, oh, please, please come in. I don't know what happened, but there was a gentleman, he came here, I shouted at him, I abused him, I, I, I felt very bad, I'm so happy you've come, and like this. Then, gradually, that man came to visit the temple, and that gentleman himself, lastly, became a disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. So his anxiety with that brahmachari was not aparad. If he would have made Vaishnava aparad, then the end result would not have been he was in anxiety. Who's not in anxiety in this material world? I was in anxiety as soon as I got in the car to come here. Seat, bell, watching the speedometer, police behind. It's just like, we live in anxiety. <laughs> we're not in anxiety because we're, in, you know, we're always in anxiety in this world. But he was in just a little more anxiety. You see, but he was not envious. Just he was become angry. You see. So Vaishnava Abharat is committed when there's actually envy engage in prajalpa, we'll do not chant our beads, we'll do so many things and we won't take to the name. And the thing is, we really don't believe it. It's like we're told, the room at the end of the hall on the right, they're passing out gold coins, Kruger rands from South Africa, as many as you can carry out of the room. Right? Why wouldn't you go there and get them? Because you don't believe it's actually gold. You don't believe it's actually happened. So it's all about shraddha, faith. Increasing our faith. When faith is there in the beginning, it increases, and it takes different forms. And its last form is called prema. There is a verse in uh, uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Adho Shraddha Sadhu Sangha. In the beginning, there will simply be faith. That faith, then, Sadhu Sangha, will lead us to Sadhu Sangha. In Sadhu Sangha, we will uh, accept the advice of sadhus, and we will enter uh, Bhajana Kriya. Adoshadha sadhu sangha bhajana kriya. Bhajana kriya means there we'll have diksha. We'll take mantra, both the holy name and Vaishnava mantra. Then anarthanivritti. 
without mantra, without Vaishnav Diksha, without this connection, can't, can't succeed in an Arthana Vritti, can't cross an Arthana Vritti, must come in this line. Uh, it is not extraneous. We have to have faith. Faith is what draws that down to us. And if faith tells me I can't find a Vaishnav, I can't take initiation, then at least don't fool yourself to think that you will progress to Prema without even passing Bhajana Kriya. Bhajana Kriya doesn't just mean how to do Achman, the Sadhu will show how to do Achman, how to pay very clean dandabats in front of the deities and how to just do it like a soldier. No. Real Bhajana Kriya means what's inside your heart how to cultivate the proper feelings of a Vaishnava. That instruction we must get. And then we will enter into an Arthanavritti, clearing, clearing, clearing all the obstacles that stand in our way. Then nishta. Then we are fixed up. Then we are fixed up. If we are troubled by anarthas and we have no faith to accept guru, to accept Vaishnava guidance, then we cannot be nishta. And, and, the, and this is, Nishna is not something, Nishna is a form of Shraddha, it is the next stage of Shraddha. Although it is not called, it's not, they're not saying Shraddha Nishta, Shraddha Nartha Nariti. Uh, the purport of all the Acharyas, it is the development of Shraddha, Nishta. And when we are fixed up, then Ruchi. Ruchi means taste. Hmm? When getting the taste for the holy name, you are safe. It is said you are safe there. When getting a taste. If even you're fixed up, but you don't have a taste. Mahabrabhu says, I have no taste for the holy name. Then we can, should consider that Aparad is somehow standing in our way. There must develop a taste, a sweet taste for the holy name of Krishna. When there is taste, then we're not guided anymore like uh, we are guided by the driving manual, you see. I don't read a driving manual in so many years. I have my experience on the road. I watch the cars in front, back, both mirrors, all these things. You have your experience out there. And that is your guide, not the uh, highway patrolman's manual. Not anymore, you see. You go beyond that, you have an experience which is your guide, you see. So the taste for Krishna takes over, and that becomes our guide. You see. Uh, that is not to say Guru is not there. But our inner taste is there, and that taste guides us. We begin then to find the next step through a taste, and that taste becomes addictive. That is called a shakti. It means we become very attached to that sweet taste, you see. And then that attachment leads to bhava. Bhava means the awakening of emotions, feelings of love, sentiments of love. You, you, one time, just as uh, Maharaj didn't see, or we were all sitting together and forgotten, he sat and he was sitting backwards to the deities. Once I was fanning Srila Prabhupada in the Delhi Pandal, and somehow, the way I was standing to fan his divine grace, my back was to the deities. And so then I'm, I'm fanning him with the ch chamra, and the kirtan and everything was going on, and then he, uh, all of a sudden I realize he's, he's motioning to, to, to me to come forward. So I, I come forward and he tells me, don't put your back on the deity. You know, move to the side. So to fan him on the side, it was, I couldn't even really do it. So it was, it was a show. I was kind of doing it, but I couldn't really fan him. I was making a show of it, but I couldn't actually get any wind to go there. So I was really not fanning. For the, for the audience, it looks like I'm fanning him, but I'm not. You see. So is it his rule? Is it a rule that says you should not have your backs to the deity? There may be such rule. One should not turn his back on the deity, you see. But if you enter into some living experience with a person, you see, and you, for example, somebody does something, uh, you know, like talks back to an elder, you know. So there's a rule. You shouldn't talk back to your parents or you shouldn't talk back to your auntie or your uncle or whatever the case may be. You see your elderly family member. So it's the rule. It's there, right? But the person that's standing there correcting you, are they just quoting a rule? No. It's made them feel bad. You've, you've shouted at your mother. You've, you've shouted at your father. And that other person 
they, f they feel bad. And they say, you know, this shouldn't be done. You see, So for those who can't understand the subtler side, the rule is there, don't do this. But those who understand the subtler side, that such things are painful, they never, they never do those things. Do you follow? So when we understand what is... What creates grief to a Vaishnava, we give that up. Prabhupada once wrote a letter. I am more, uh, what did he say? He's, uh, it creates me more disturbance when you fight with each other than when if you break one of the regulative principles. You see? So we are thinking that if somebody eats non-veg, that is the worst thing ever. But it isn't the worst thing ever. The worst thing ever is that the Vaishnavas are fighting with each other. That is the worst thing ever that he told. That, that is more troubling to me, you see. Why? Well, if you have done some wrong, you have eaten some non veg, you are the sufferer there. You, number one, you, you are the sufferer. You are fighting with somebody else, two, three, four, five, six, or who knows, thousand people may suffer because of your fighting. You see. This has also gone on extensively. One, two, three, four individuals fighting, five, six, seven, one thousand suffer. So it is actually uh, so when we know what is pleasing to Krishna, when we know what is pleasing, hmm, when we are guided by that taste, and it's not just the taste that we are relishing. No, that taste is like that also. What is pleasing to the Vaishnavas? What is disturbing to the Vaishnavas? A sense, a deeper sense of divinity in this ruchi. You see, in this ruchi, a deeper sense of divinity, and then a stronger attachment, and then the bhava, the feelings of love. Develop and then and then the prema mm -hmm. means spontaneous, uh, spontaneous love of God. And there are five stages after that also, but we don't speak much of them ever. Sneha, mana, mana, uh, raga, anuraga, uh, bhava, mahabhava. Five stages also, five or six stages also after prema. But what is prema? We still, I don't know what is prema. But it is something so wonderful that even the crores of demigods will stand in line for a drop of it. Even Mahaprabhu, he performs his daily life as if just to seek out a drop of divine love. You see. So, um, What was your question? My question was about uh, Nam. Yeah. I was chanting and, and just feeling that it's just so like almost impossible for me, but for many of us to chant offensively and um, offenselessly. Offenselessly, and and the question came in my head: Is there, is there, can I serve the name, or is there such like? Well, <clears throat> where you been the last three months? You've been hitting the beach in San Diego, so you, you should be feeling that way. Uh, so, um, we, but we all begin somewhere. We all begin somewhere, and sometimes we, we, have, we struggle for a while, and then we, we come back. And this is going on sometimes three times in a day. But when do you stop thinking of leaving? You see? Or did you not stop thinking of leaving? You see? I mean, in the beginning, everybody thinks of leaving. And then some people leave. And some people come back, and it goes on. But there is a point, there is a time when you stop thinking of leaving. And it's just, it is impossible to even think leaving. How can you leave Krishna? There is no place where there is no Krishna. There, is, there isn't anything but Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada used to say, you just stay here, chanting the name and following these principles. He used to beg that, just do this. But we don't believe in that, so we don't do that. So, but what he's saying is we have no taste for the holy name. Well, our chanting isn't even proper to serve the holy name. Two things are said. Yes, the name himself says, but you keep on chanting. You can't do the push-up, keep on trying. If you give up, how you ever do it? So you don't give up the name, even if you can't chant the name, but you take up the service of Vaishnavas. That is your saving grace. Vaishnavas save us. Serve us. And what is their service? They want you to go out and sell a book. They want you to clean the pot. They want you to paint the walls. So many things. They want you to stitch for the deities. They want you to do an artik. They want you to learn the scripture. They want you to sit in here. This is all coming in the line of Vaishnav Seva. 
And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's movement, he said, if you hear the Bhagavatam without authorization, or try to preach the Bhagavatam without authorization, it just produces a mundane sound, good for nothing, he said. You cannot hear the Bhagavatam unless you are invited. You cannot speak the Bhagavatam unless you are authorized. It is not an independent endeavor, either the hearing or the chanting. We must be invited to that assembly. We must be requested. And Sukadeva and others, they're requesting all the uh, assembled uh, uh, sages. Uh, they're assembling uh, there. They are, they are requesting them. Uh, you please give your blessings uh, uh, to, 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 to speak on this topic. <clears throat> Not that he just went in there all puffed up, said, I know more than everybody else, sat right down. You see this in India. The speakers in Gaudiya Mutt, before speaking, they ask the assembly of devotees for a blessing. That they will, uh, on your uh, blessings, uh, I will be able to speak some words, uh, a glorification of our masters, divine masters, and glorification of Mahabrabhu, and glorification of the Supreme Lord. Keeping always the, the form there, keeping some form, some etiquette, you see. It's like in this country, we extend our hand and we shake hands. If we don't do that, people think, hmm, like kind of a cold meeting there. You know, like the meeting of the hands. Hi, John. Hi, Paul. We shake the hands. It's just the cultural thing. You see, it's not very deep. But Lord Brahma also shook hands with Krishna. I don't know exactly which way he shook hands, but it says he shook hands with Krishna. You see. <coughs> so, but there's some formality there to establish the relationship. So, uh, but if we are all just on the formality and we don't actually develop the relationship, then of course that's just a show. You see, show of humility, show of culture. You see, we have to enter into the real thing, the real thing of substance. We should think when entering any assembly of devotees uh, that we are not better than any person assembled there, uh, right down to the children. Although if the children make too much noise, we may ask them to leave, not because we feel better than them, just we can't understand what they're saying, so they should go somewhere else. But the point is, if you feel better than somebody, well, that's the proof that you're not. You There's a Mahabharat, Krishna asked Duryodhana, and who's the other one? Yudhisthira. He told Yudhisthira, or he told Duryodhana first, he told, you go and find someone who is more qualified than you, in, Sh in Artha Shastra and so many things. You go out and find a man who is superior to you. And then he told Yudhisthira, you go find someone who has less qualification than you. Follow? So Duryodhana, you find someone who is greater than you. And Yudhisthira, you find someone who has less qualification than you. Yes, my lord, they both went out into the kingdom. After some time, some days, I think, maybe, uh, they came back and both were alone. They were alone. So Krishna asked uh, Duryodhana, why? You came back alone? Oh, my Lord, there's no one better than me. <laughs> Wherever I went, I saw that no one is superior to me. Then Yudhisthira said, why you came back alone? He said, uh, my Lord, wherever I went, I found that everyone is superior to me. I could not find anyone lower than myself. Lowest of the low. So the devotee, the non-devotee. Duryodhana, non-devotee. Highly qualified in so many things, but non-devotee. The vision of a devotee is not that he feels himself better than others. <clears throat> the real vision of a devotee, he feels himself servant of others. There is a danger if you know something. That danger is you may become puffed up while sharing it with others. Very dangerous. It has happened to more than one person. You come to know something divine or something very high. And in the course of sharing it with others, it vanishes from you because you become arrogant in dealing with that higher subject. It is there in Chaitanya Charitamrita and different things. Sometimes the grace is withdrawn from a devotee because of some misappropriation in dealing with the, that, the higher world. The higher world is not our slave. Although it is said, lastly, Krishna himself is a slave of love. Huh? He gives himself fully to those devotees who have cultivated love for him. Hmm? Nonetheless, he is still the supreme. He is the supreme enjoyer. He is the autocrat. He is the one who is independent. You see. 
and he can withdraw himself at any time, at any moment from our midst. Uh, Sometimes we say, Prabhupada used to say, yes, Krishna has taken birth in the womb of Iskon. But we should not think, what well, is said once, it is just sealed like the Catholic Church for all time. How, how, he, how he came here in the first place, we should see that. How he came in this movement in the first place and tried to hold, you see, that mood and that situation, you see, that the Supreme Lord felt so confident to come and take his place amidst us, you see. So I don't say that he's gone, but we shouldn't think that, eh, he's in our pocket, he's here, close the door, he can't get out. No, if that, even that much arrogance, he can vanish in a heartbeat. You see. Arrogance is never the qualification to attract the Supreme Lord. Never. Humility is the crown jewel of the Vaishnava. It is, it is the, uh, what's it, it is the Koinur jewel, the crown jewel. Just like in England, there's one jewel of all jewels, the Koinur diamond, the crown jewel, the center jewel. So the, the most attractive quality in a devotee, Krishna finds so attractive, is Vaishnava humility. But Vaishnava humility, not like the humility of this world. No, not like the humility of this world. Humility of this world is weakness of heart. A Vaishnava is very strong at heart, very strong. Humility means submission to guru, submission to Vaishnava, not to the mob in the street. That is not humility, to bow your head before the mob. Submission to the dacoit, the gundas, the thugs, the ruffians and the skinheads. That is not humility. Humility means to abide by the order of our guru. That is humility. And to sometimes carry out that order, one may have to also demonstrate anger in the service of Krishna. Like in South Africa, there was one devotee, a very humble devotee, and all of a sudden he looked out and there was a drunkard outside pulling up the Tulsi plants, just ripping them out of the ground. You see, And he would not listen to reason. In the end, the only thing he listened to was a big fist. So a very humble devotee gave him a very humble big fist. Good. Ripping the plants out of the ground. What do you do? Someone comes in to uh, massacre your family in the night. Do you very humbly uh, submit to being massacred? Or do you very, very humbly crack his head with a pot? <laughs> very humbly split his skull, if you have to. You see. Well, what is humility? It is not a weakness of heart. You know, <clears throat> um, Generally, whenever the Hollywood makes a movie about a saint, it's pathetic. It's usually a person who is just doesn't know what he's doing, kind of just is just a weaky, weak-hearted guy, doesn't know for what. You see. But recently, this movie was made called Gladiator. Did anybody see that? Don't raise your hand; it's incriminating. <laughs> I'll say the same thing they always say. I saw it on the airplane. <laughs> What could I do? It was right there in front of me. But that, that person in that movie, that main star, I don't know what his name was, but anyway, the guy that plays the, he plays some, uh, what's he play, a general. I thought, this is the closest they've ever come to a saintly person. It's just he's playing the wrong world, role. He, he was hum humble, he was composed, he was in control of his senses. Nonetheless, he was firm and determinated. You know, all the, all the things that are listed in saintly characters, you see. He was not a weak person. He was strong, but he was fair and just. He was determined. You know, he's, he was everything we'd like our leaders to be today. They're all just the opposite. Dacoits, womanizers, drunkards, <sighs> criminals. So people nowadays, they don't know what is a saint. They don't know what a saintly person is. You see. They do not know what a saintly person is. A saintly person is indeed hard to find in this world. But by the grace of Krishna, they sometimes come to this world and they show us a proper path of living, a proper path of development and culture that we can approach the perfection of life and become saintly ourselves. Why did you join this Krishna consciousness movement? You joined this Krishna consciousness movement to become a pure devotee of Krishna. If you didn't, you joined for the wrong reason. That is why you join Krishna consciousness, to become just like Prabhupada. Just like Prabhupada, in a sense, a pure devotee of Krishna, to have love of God, to have love of Krishna. What? 
you, you didn't have a house, you didn't have a car, you didn't have any friends, you didn't have anything to eat. That's not why we came to Krishna consciousness. Maybe we can't even express why in the beginning, but in time, we will know, yes, we came to develop love of Krishna. Prema Pumartha Mahan. This is why we came. This is what we found in those people. Something is there. They have got something different than everybody else. It's not just a hairstyle. It's just not a neat way of dressing. Or they have got something, this new kind of mash or whatever it's called. No, they have got something wonderful. I want that. I want part of that, even a drop of that. We join this Krishna consciousness movement to become pure devotees of Krishna, to develop love of Krishna. Then don't let that goal out of your sight. Be just like Arjuna. See only the eye of the bird. See nothing else. His master said, do you see the bird? No. Do you see the head of the bird? No. What do you see? I see only the eye. He was told, take his aim. You know the story, Mahabharata, aim. You say, what do you see? Do you see the bird? Yes. Okay, don't shoot. Then another one. What do you see? Do you see the bird? No. You see the head? Yes, I see only the head. No, don't shoot. Then Arjuna just saw the eye. You see anything? I see nothing else. Just the eye. You can't see anything else around it. Nothing. No, I only see the eye. Shoot. Arjuna shoots him. It was a false bird. Pierces the eye of the bird. So we should have a focus. Why we came here? Don't become a self-deceiver. A self-deceiver means you come for one purpose, but you get involved in something else along the way and shortchange yourself for the, for the real reason you came. You see? If you want independence, then the Hare Krishna movement is a bad place to be. <laughs> if you want service, it's a great place to be. If you want to be master, this is not a good place. If you want to be servant, this is a great place. If you want wealth, this is not a good place to be. If you want to give your wealth, please come to my office <laughs> after the class. <laughs> so um, just imagine that you enter into a place where everybody's giving, you see. I mean, everyone is giving, no one is taking. And the kind of an atmosphere that that creates. Everyone knows. The greatest gift is in giving, not in receiving, you see. We can be given so many things, but the gift of giving is greater. Even in this world, it is known. It is known by those who, who watch the heart, who study love, feelings, affections, and emotions. They determine the joy of giving is greater than that of receiving, you see. So much so the joy of giving that Krishna himself, he wants to taste the joy of giving. He wants to become a devotee of him, himself of himself. You see. And not just any type devotee. He wants to become the type devotee, which is Srimati Radharani. What type devotee she is, he wants to enter into that mood. So the two combine, Radha and Krishna, and they come to the world as one beautiful form in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Krishna, in the mood of Radharani, he's serving himself. He's tasting the sweetness of devotion. What is devotion? Selfless devotion. They, what do I was trying to remember earlier when Srila Prabhupada arrived in Boston, he saw a sign. It said, Absolute Steel? Unalloyed. Unalloyed. That was it. I couldn't get it. Not absolute. Unalloyed. And the steel, that's irrelevant. But the man must be of the steel, hmm? not of the straw. So there it was. This is going to take a man of unalloyed steel. What, what stands before you? Only the man of the highest caliber of devotion will penetrate these shores. Huh? But more than the steel, we kind of always focus on the steel, the man of the steel coming in. But the key is in the unalloyed. For my purpose if you have come here, for my work if you have come here, and for no purpose of your own whatsoever, even down to one atom of your own existence, if you have come for me, then you will be successful. The demand was there, he saw it, unalloyed. No mixture, nothing of his own, only the work of his guru and the work of Krishna. And he came forward ready to accept that. Unalloyed devotion, pure devotion, not mixed devotion. Mixed devotion is a detour. So, yes, it happens, we get sidetracked, you see. 
just like we made a wrong turn coming here from Vermont. I was like, wait a minute, back up. This is not right. We went back. We had to take a little bit of a detour, but we got back on track, you see. But what if we just kept going? Well, we'd be over on the shore in uh, New Hampshire by now. You, see. you can't just say, well, I'm going. You see, like the, when we were hippies, we used to get out there on the highway, and you'd stand there like this, and you see a car coming the other way, jump on the other side of the road. The idea was just so you're going somewhere. But that's, that's not Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness must be going somewhere and know what that somewhere is. So what are you going to do now? Run around to everybody and make sure everybody else is on track. That's also part of the problem. Checking up on the other guy to make sure the other person is on track. That's also off track. Just put yourself on track. This fellow, the Dalai Lama, you know his face? Dalai Lama, the head of the Tibetan Buddhism. And he was in Kumbh Mela. And uh, <clears throat> Kumbh Mela, the biggest... Uh, uh, oh, but by the way, there's a video of Kumbh Mela here. Uh, we may see it later, who has the time. But the, the Dalai Lama was hearing all these talks, and uh, so this one lady gave an introduction, and she mentioned this, was, this will be um, something, a, a memorable event, and from here there will be world peace, and it will spread all over the world. And she said something like that in introducing Dalai Lama in the ashram of this one uh, yogi named Muniji. So the Dalai Lama gave his speech, and he said, wherever I go in the world, whether it's religious or political function, I hear peace. Everybody talking word of mouth, peace, peace. You know, see, and it's like, yeah, right. Everybody's talking peace from the United Nations to wherever, all over the Middle East. Everybody's talking peace. But then he says, but peace has to begin inside, he said. He pointed to his chest. Peace has to begin here. So Dalai Lama represents the atheistic community, atheism. They don't believe in the existence of Bhagavan, Ishwar, or God. They don't even believe in Atma or soul. Buddhism doesn't believe in anything spiritual. And all emotions are matter and are products of the mind. Uh, so a, a Buddhist is actually not a spiritual person. A Buddhist are atheism, atheistic. They don't acknowledge any of the tenets of theism. But at least he knows that whatever you want, it begins with yourself. It begins with number one. So progress, if it's just peace you're after, begins with yourself. So we want to see self, we want to see improvement in the quality of the Krishna consciousness movement. No one would say, we don't. We do. Uh, we all want to see improvement. Well, that begins with number one. Improve yourself. If everybody just tries to improve themselves at being a better Vaishnava, when's the last time you read the 26th? Sorry, 25 qualities of a Vaishnava. Hmm? Probably years ago, Srila Prabhupada used to say, you should read them and see how far you're developing them. Be aware of what they are. And at least in a conscious way, try for that. Try for those qualities. You see. At least in a sense, be aware. There's some quality development necessary here. It's not a all about quantity. In 1972, which is a long time ago, and if you get a Back to Godhead magazine, and see how many temples we had then, and then get a Vyasa Puja book and count the numbers of devotees. We all used to sign our own names in those books at that time. At that time, Prabhupada said, we have enough temples and we have enough devotees. Now it's time to boil the milk. And he wasn't talking about staying home from Sankirtan and just cooking sweet rice. <laughs> boil the milk means to get it down to the real business at hand. Let's get this thing together. Let's go ahead with the real thing that this is about. And I'm, uh, and, but nothing changed. That letter came around. It was stunning for about a half a day, but nothing seemed to change. Everything just seemed to go on. And focus was always on numbers, scores, sheets, quotas. And these things went on and on, and probably they still go on in many places. But that is not what the Krishna consciousness movement, movement is about, quantity. It is a movement for quality. Lastly, if even one person becomes a pure devotee of Krishna, that may be acceptable because it is such a rare thing. But yet an opportunity is given that every individual who comes to this Krishna consciousness movement has the opportunity to become a pure devotee of Krishna. In that way, by their grace, it is not such a rare thing. Rupa Goswami says you should become a pure devotee within three or four days of joining the, your, your Guru Maharaj's mission. That's what he says. In nectar devotion. What is that? Why you should join and, and be a, uh, remain a Kanishta? 
why you should join and have your little baggage of all your material attachments here. You know, you got, you got your lollipops and you got your snackies in the bag. No, come and accept prasadam, take the holy name, rid yourself of this life, this, this materialistic, self-centered, egotistical life, and embrace what? The life of pure devotion. Huh. Then you progress through these stages. Prema is down the line. We think, become pure devotee, you get prema. No, 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 no. You become a pure devotee, improve yourself there in pure devotion. Then you get prema. It's not all one, one, one just like a ball, everything in one. You just get it all at once. No. First, you and, once Prabhupada wrote Tushta Krishna, my god brother, and he told all my disciples are pure devotees. He told him, why you say only one is pure, another one is not pure? This will ruin everything. So I thought, how this can be? How this can be? Everyone is pure devotee. How this can be? Then I thought, what do you call a coal miner? Sorry. What do you call a person who works in a coal mine? You call him a coal miner. What do you call a person who's only engaged in pure devotional service under the guidance of a pure devotee? Those engaged persons are called pure devotees. Then you have to go through these stages, up to nishta and, and, and so forth, up to prema. It's not that you just become a pure devotee in the end. You have to become a pure devotee. Rupa Goswami says within three or four days, give up your nonsense, surrender to Krishna. Why chalk it out that it's going to take a lifetime? I'll do it when I'm older. Right now I want to enjoy being the temple president. I want to enjoy being the sangatana. I want to enjoy being the pajari so everybody looks at me when I'm waving the ghee lamp or something. You know, you ever notice a good Pajari, you can't even see him up there. Sometimes they even walk in front of the deities, it's like they're invisible. Because a good Pajari doesn't want to obstruct the view of the deity, you see. He's moving around and doing things so people aren't having the darshan. He doesn't just get right up there and show you his back and doing things like that. They, they, they seem to have a mystical thing about him. They just move around there, you don't see him, you see. Pajari means always with the deity and unseen, you see. In Vrindavan, it's so charming, right? Pajaris are always just like coming around. <laughs> I was about to show you about half their face around the door. You see, they're always peering back, peering like that. When they close the doors, they have a little technique for doing that. They close the door little by little by little by little by little. And if you look in the temple room, everybody's drawn to the center. In the beginning, you're all over the room, and in the end, everybody's drawn to the center until the door is just like a half an inch. And you can just see. Krishna for the last time that day and the Lord takes rest. No, the, 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 the hmm. anyway, I was remembering that. So, um, hmm. what is that? Hmm. Anyway, back to that point, that uh, self-improvement, you know. People uh, tell about these self-improvement workshops and all these things, but that's what the ashram is. An ashram is an intense, you know, unending seminar for self-improvement. It starts from 3 o'clock in the morning and it don't stop till 10, 10.30, 10 11 o'clock at night. It's just, it is for self-improvement. It's not for finding a, if you're looking for a place to live, the world's a great place. There's beautiful lakes, mountains out there. Yeah, the temples are horrible places to live, actually. If you want to be an enjoyer, if you want all these things, then why do you want to live in a temple? That's terrible. But if you want self-improvement, it's about your only choice, you see. Get to the temple because that's where the Lord is. That's where the Lord's devotees are. That's where the prasadam is. And that's where the holy name is. That's where the scripture is. You don't have to buy all the books. You just come and move in the temple. You get them for free. In fact, you get so many of them, you get to give them to other people. <laughs> all right. Hare Krishna. Thank you for uh, coming and uh, uh, making me s tell something about Krishna consciousness. Thank you very much. Thank you for this gift also. <laughs>